Hi, Alana Diamond. I am so happy to be here with you today and have you as a guest on Unfounded. Our topic today is women writing checks. Um, waited a long time to even have this be a topic. So that's so, it's so exciting. Uh, we are gonna explore this topic uh, by asking each other only three questions. One looks to the past, one speaks to the present, and one leans into the future. And as you know, the third question, the one about the future, that's the wild card. We have not shared this question with each other in advance. Um, and, uh, and as you also know, no formal bios on this show. So in lieu of formal bios, I've asked you to come up with three words uh, to use to introduce yourself today. So let her rip. Okay. Well, my three words are curious, impatient, and persistent. And I remember uh, we had a little conversation about these words and uh, uh, you, we talked a little bit uh, about the difference between persistent and relentless. And yes. you, and I, you and I have uh, gone back and forth on how we've been interpreted as both uh, through the years and how I'm pretty fond of both persistent and relentless in the right, in the right context, right? Uh, so mm -hmm. anybody uh, uh, listening or watching today, if you wanna learn more about Alana's incredible career uh, as an entrepreneur, as a mentor, as an investor, uh, you can read about it uh, in the show notes. So women writing checks, here we go. Uh, we're going to start um, uh, going into the time warp. We're going to go uh, into the past. And Alana, I'm going to I'm going to kick things off. Um, and uh, oh, and I just I sorry, I should say um, one of the, the thing that's really most interesting for me about having this conversation with you is, you know, in your career as an entrepreneur and as an investor, you have you have literally launched hundreds of companies. And and I say launched, I mean, held them at the launch pad and tossed them into space. And now uh, at the helm of uh, four, at 412 Venture Fund, I mean, you've really um, progressed uh, the way that you're working with companies to a new level. And I just can't think of anybody else I'd rather have this conversation with today. Um, okay, first question about the past. Um, I am going to guess that you did not have uh, many women investors in your orbit back when you were working as an entrepreneur. Looking back, uh, did the absence of women register with you? And if so, how? And did it impact the journey that you went on and where you ended up today? So I would say definitely it impacted me because not only uh, did I not have women as investors, I didn't have investors who had invested in women or who had an interest in investing in women. So my team got a lot of questions from investors like, and this is a quote, so who really runs the company? <laughs> uh, and I think that experience was really the impetus um, for me to want to learn about VC investing after I sold my company. I'd never met a female investor while I was raising, and I got a lot of very uncomfortable offers that didn't include funding. So funding women to me seemed like not only a great investment opportunity because there's all this data that shows uh, female run companies and diverse companies with diverse teams outperform less diverse teams, but half the world is women and at least half all the buying decisions are made by women. So in an industry like VC, where we say we want to invest in founders who are passionate about the problems they're solving, and who have first-hand experience with those problems, female founders solving problems that they personally experienced just seemed like this incredible investment opportunity. And then there was the whole creating change piece because by becoming a VC, we get to influence what problems get solved and what products get made. And that just struck me as a really direct and concrete way to create change. I love that. That last part about influencing what problems get solved. That is like, I'm going to put a pin in that. That's a topic for a whole, that is a whole show about how that's going to change the world. So, all right, hit me up. Question about the past. Okay. Okay. So my first question about the past is we've talked, you and I, a lot about the struggles to add women LPs, investors to our funds. And I'm definitely facing it in our current fund. And you've just made so much progress in attracting women LPs. So I want to know what's your secret sauce? Yeah, I th I've been thinking a lot about this through the years. I, I think it's the missing part of the diversity stack. We know as fund managers and then as entrepreneurs who were funded that where your investors come from really impacts uh, how they behave. And it's certainly, they're like the quiet part of a fund, but 
as your fund manager, they're there. And so if you leave that part of the diversity stack unchecked, I think we're just, we're never going to get all the, we're never going to get all the way. Uh, and I looked at my fund and while I love my investors through the years, uh, they were all, all of them, um, older men, white, white men. And while they were in micro in a micro way, very uh, accommodating to me and our fund, you know, I, I knew that there had to be something else out there. Uh, and there's a lot of interesting stuff going on about why women have been slow to come in to early stage investing, the ways that they've been excluded uh, kind of functionally through the way wealth and wealth control uh, has changed through the years and who had control of wealth, but also in the, the kind of welcome that women received in, in early environments in startup investing and how, how much bro culture there was in investing. And, uh, and I think that that's beginning to change. You know, the way that I went at it for this most recent fund was I just set a line in the sand and decided that I was only going to allocate time to conversations with women who could be LPs and then also ask the men LPs in my life only to rec recommend and refer me to other women who they might know who would be a good fit. And it sounds really kind of bland, but it, it worked. It worked because it forced me to get up every day and think about it. And it forced me to ask people, I asked you and you ended up back channeling me to one of the coolest female LPs that I've ever met who's now in my fund. But if I hadn't asked you directly, that never would have happened. And so I think a lot of it is just about elevating the conversation, making it a priority. And then on the other side of that, when I had these conversations, I went into them listening more than talking and really trying to understand for women that are either new to investing or just maybe it felt undernourished by the fund managers who have approached them, just underappreciated. I started really listening to what information did they want more of? What were their values and what mattered more? And could I find natural, honest, and kind of robust ways to align that with what I wanted to do with the most recent RevUp fund? And that's kind of unlocked a whole, just a whole world of potential for how we're bringing more women into that circle. So it's like tip of the iceberg. Uh, I barely, I can't claim victory, but I will say making it a, an overt priority and letting all the other people around me know that that's all I cared about was a good first, a good first step. So. Mm -hmm. All right, do, 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 do. we're in the present now, present day, terra firma, here we are. Um, as somebody who has, again, seen, I mean, to, to help as many companies as you've had, the multiple of companies that you've had to look at, I mean, it's outrageous, right? Like, so to help 200 companies, you've looked at like 20,000 companies and that's independent from all the work that you've done, just even in, in the Pittsburgh ecosystem and beyond. But um, given all of that, you know, what's one quality you must see in a founder to get truly excited about investing? And, and I'd be curious if that's changed at all as your own perceptions about, the, the, about your role as a female fund manager has changed. Well, that's a really good question. Um, I'd say that the one quality, if there's just one that I look for, I'd say it's humility. And what I mean by that is knowing what you know and knowing what you don't know and not being shy about asking for and getting help that isn't your strength. You know, the biggest fails that I've seen from companies are um, founders who just couldn't admit when they needed help. And the best CEOs that I've seen are the ones who knew when it was time to ask for help. And I guess the way that I kind of look for that is, you can even tell that in your first few meetings when they're pitching. You know, a founder that says, I don't know the answer to that, but I'll check and I'll get back to you. Or you ask a question and they throw the answer to one of their teammates who they say, you know, knows more about that and acknowledges that that person is an expert on that topic. They don't need to be the expert on every topic. To me, that's an indication of a self-aware leader. And that is um, one of the most important qualities in a leader. And as we all know, it's really all about team when you're funding a company, I mean, a great idea with a mediocre team or a not self-aware team can just fall apart, but even just an okay idea with the right team, a strong team, you know, they can figure out where the weaknesses are, fix them and turn that into a great company. So we're really looking for folks who understand what they know and what they don't know, who know, um, I, you know, if somebody says to me, I'm going to be the right person to run this company until XYZ. And then I think it'll be time maybe 
to bring someone else in if I haven't grown into that role and I would take this other role. People who are just self-aware and who are more, they're humble about it and they're more concerned with the success of the company and their team than they are with proving they're the smartest person in the room, even though many of them really are the smartest person in the room. So yeah. that's what I'd say. And in terms of changing, yes, I think it did change. I think uh, earlier in my career, I was more influenced by you know, how smooth the pitch was and how self-assured you know, the founder was. And I realized at some point that, A, some of that's just training. You know, you went to a place where they taught you how to do that, whether it's an accelerator or, you know, a school with an entrepreneurship program. So some of it was, could just be trained. And, and some of it actually indicated a problem, not, not a positive trajectory, because these folks were so sure of themselves, they weren't going to see a problem coming if it hit them in the face. So I think I have changed. I, I am no longer put off by someone who says, you know, I don't know, or I didn't think about that. I, I yeah. see that as, that's a strength. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a big change. And I, and I do think that if that reflects um, who's listening. And I think um, some of the machismo in that, um, I think having different people on the, on the receiving side of the pitch is gonna create more space for people to be, I think more honest uh, actors, right? When they, then when they talk about their hopes and dreams and fears, right? For sure. I'm very excited about that. All right. We're in the present. Hit me up. Uh, are we in the future? Oh, no. no the present uh, for I have, you. I yes, have, yes, yeah, yes. Gonna, yep. yes. Sorry about that. Oh, I'm so, always ready for the future. So I'm surprised <laughs> I'm the one. I'm surprised I'm the one that didn't just get right past it and go to the future. Yeah, really. So, um, you know, we're hearing all about the new regulations around crowdfunding. And so I'm curious, how do you think that Reg CF is changing the landscape for female funders and founders. Is that going to make any big changes? I Yes. I think it's really important uh, that we are coming up with new ways to bring kind of micro investors uh, and to give people some more control over their fundraising, right? Instead of having to go only to a small group of funds that exist, you can go out to the world and go out to communities of people who have money uh, that they want to invest. And I, I'm so glad we're past this fear that grandma will get fleeced by the, by the entrepreneurs out there, right? I think we're past that. Um, I think a couple of things that I'm seeing in trends, you know, the reality around crowdfunding is, is while these platforms are getting better at helping um, people promote their companies through these platforms, so much of a, of a crowdfunding campaign success is still tied to the company's ability to promote itself and to create that flywheel effect. And so when you see a lot of the successful campaigns, um, they're run by people who have some access to networks of privilege that they can activate around their campaigns. So in some ways, the first the first beneficiaries of these platforms have been those who are already benefiting from the, the system at large. And so I think what we're what we're seeing now is an attempt to kind of democratize those platforms and recognize that the amplification and the promotion of the opportunities is as important as the qualities of uh, the quality of, of that. And so I think we have a lot of work to do uh, to not just expect that because of anyone can get on a platform that everyone will be served on a platform. And I think you'll see that many of the architects of these platforms, you know, were not themselves coming from diverse backgrounds. They were run by guys who were frustrated by venture and they wanted to make more money than they could uh, running the funds that they were running. Um, so I think that there's a lot of opportunity there. I, you know, I think realistically too, um, helping founders really understand and educate themselves about the implications of these platforms. You know, it's not like Kickstarter. Uh, where if you don't ship your thing, it all goes away, right? I mean, it's a it's a micro cap table that you're going to have and you're going to carry with you. And I think when you think about um, what's going to happen when the first the first wave of losers, because there will be lots of losers. There's going to be a lot of companies on these platforms that don't have successful exits, right? And it's going to be hard for these companies to pay those investors back. I think there's going to be a lot of opportunity for uh, fine tuning. And so I hope that women and other founders who have been left out of traditional venture will be included in the problem solving uh, as well as you know, not just on the sort of be the tokens on the platform, but really be part of taking this beginning, this nascent opportunity and really starting to think about how do we, how do we really explode it and push it so that it, it allows people to really find the founders that they, they want to invest in and make those relationships profitable. So I think it's gonna be a big change I just don't think we're quite there yet. And to claim it, like to take a state accompli, I think that would be a mistake. 
So, but it's pretty exciting. All right, do, 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 do. back in the time machine. We're heading to the we're heading to the future. Uh, wild card round here. So, um, so I think there's going to be a sea change in investing culture uh, as more women take senior and leadership roles in in fund management. As more women write checks, I I really do. I think it's going to change behaviors all the way down that diversity stack. Um, and you're going to be a big part of that. Uh, what do you want your mark on this moment to be? And I guess like in another way of saying, what do you want, what do you want most to bequeath to this next generation? And if there's something that you can change or secure for this next generation of founders, what would you like it to be? So I guess it would be to have a broader lens on what um, what a founder looks like, what a CEO behaves like, what kind of um, what kind of answers we expect from folks. I think that we, you know, by having um, male, mostly white uh, VCs for so many years, there's been this pattern matching, right? So folks were looking for founders who looked like the founders who had made them a lot of money in the past. And for the most part, those were relatively young, they were white, they were male, and they behaved a certain way. And, and, and maybe that gets to the point that I was making before about humility as well. You know, humility was not a valued quality, right? It was, you know, I know what I'm doing. I've, I've got this. I'm going to rock this. We're, you know, don't admit any weakness ever. Don't admit how you feel, not to your funders, not to the people you're pitching to, not to your employees. So I guess what I'd like to do is broaden that lens of what makes a good leader, and um, honestly, this is something that I thought a lot about when I became the CEO of my company, SEMA Products. I, before that, I'd worked for a consulting firm where, you know, if you're a woman, you didn't have a picture of your family on your desk. And, you, you know, if you needed to do something for your family, you know, you would make up some excuse like I've got a doctor's appointment or whatever it was. It wasn't yeah. something around you being a woman. And when I <laughs> took over as CEO... I remember making a conscious decision that I was going to say this to all our employees. I have a parent teacher conference. My yeah. child has a doctor's appointment. And the point was to say that kind of behavior, caring about my family, having a family, also yeah. having a career, you know, didn't make me a less effective leader or CEO. And I want us, uh, you know, and, and that's just one piece in being able to see people as full people and being able to see CEOs in all different shapes, sizes, heights, colors, genders, and uh, asking yourself as a, an investor when somebody's pitching to you and, and maybe they don't fit exactly what you're used to seeing as a, as a founder or a CEO saying to yourself, is that my bias? Is that something that you know really affects their ability to be an effective leader? Or is that just something I'm not used to seeing? And having explicit discussions about that with your you know, other partners, and we do at 412 Venture Fund, we'll ask ourselves, you know, the way that person pitched was unusual. And let's talk about how that affected us. Is that a bias yeah. we have? Or is that really something that we should be paying attention to about their ability to lead as a, as a founder? So that's one of the marks I'd like to make. I'd like the folks who work with me to see me asking myself those questions and see me admitting you know, my own biases and trying to make them explicit and discuss them and have them do the same so that we can yeah. have a wider range of founders. Yeah, there isn't one type of successful CEO. It's all about the right match, right? Right company, right mm -hmm. founder, right leader, right team. Yeah, I love that. I love that. Yeah. All right. Take us to the home finish here. Home stretch. Yes. So you talked a lot about the things that you had learned and done to attract more women to your fund. And some of it was about listening. And I'm wondering, are there also structural things? Because one of the things we found is even when we're well-meaning and we have goals, sometimes there are structural um, sort of historical ways that funds are um, set up or that we, that we uh, set limits for who can be a limited partner or what we require of a limited partner or what we do for a limited partner or how we get limited partners. And I'm wondering, are there structural things that we could change as VCs and as managing partners of VCs that would make our funds more comfortable for women, um, more attractive for women and easier as an investment for women? 
Um, yes, yes, and yes. Um, I've learned a lot from, um, I, I work with a woman named Sylvia, Sylvia Kwan, who's the um, VP of investment for Elevest, which is a wealth management platform for women. And uh, she educated me on the changes they've made structurally to make it better for women to invest uh, themselves into their wealth management platform. And I learned a lot from that. Um, there are so many different considerations that women have when they, when they finally have enough capital to invest. They don't look like the men who came before them. The, and don't, they don't look like them in so many ways. I think there's been so much patterning around men of a certain age have this risk profile and all wealth management and all investment tolerances and, and, that's, and all the funds kind of patterned off that. Women are coming to the party uh, with pent up demand, a whole different experience and a whole different set of expectations. Again, uh, across the spectrum, there's no one woman investor around what they want the ROI on that investment to be, uh, what impact they want that investment to have beyond their own wealth creation, what role they wanna have in um, like a visibility that they wanna have into what the overall outcomes of the fund are and how they wanna experience that that are as, as robust as their male counterparts are, but they don't pattern match exactly the same. And so there are things from when you have minimums, right? Those are real considerations. If you wanna bring younger women into your fund, they may not be able to make a hundred or $200,000 minimum, right? Now, of course, you may not want to lower that because the headache of managing all that might, not, might be too much, but you can start to think about allowing women to pair up uh, to make their own syndicates, uh, which is something that we've done in order to keep our minimum in a place where the management of it makes sense. And it's also not just privileging other investors that are coming in at higher numbers, allowing them to team up to, uh, so maybe they can't afford you know, all the units, but they can create their own syndicates and come in that way. But I think the biggest shift is really recognizing that women across many different age groups are really thinking about return on investment differently than the men who came into startup investing before them. And, they're, it's, and it's not to say that all women care about you know, impact or triple bottom line, but there is a very large generation of women now that have enough money to invest. They want to invest in entrepreneurship, but they want to do so in a way that really is paying it forward and either paying it forward by investing into organizations or businesses that impact the world in ways they care about or investing into founders that they are, that resonate with them, either first time founders, immigrant women, second tier geographies. And if, if funds just don't have really creative, compelling, transparent ways to, to offer that, it's really off putting to these women investors and they just they don't have time. Uh, for it. So I think that's been something structurally, uh, as well as from a narrative standpoint, that's made a huge difference. Now, the good news is, is I think uh, we're at the beginning of this new generation of women fund managers. And I think we as fund managers are already redefining ROI and redefining our expectations for investor engagement and behavior. So I think we're, we're sort of arriving at the same place at the same time, but there's a huge amount of education that we need to do as first generation fund managers to make all those structural elements transparent, to make them easy to understand. And just don't assume that a, a new female LP comes to the party with all that kind of uh, informal training that, that your male investors may have had from just being around other angel investors or being around other uh, entrepreneurs. And I found just simple opportunities to explain things um, uh, thoughtfully uh, and not to be kind of almost don't be that founder you were talking about where I just bloviate about, you know, the, what the IRR is and what the you know, just and instead talk a little bit about the thesis, the philosophy, the people behind the fund, the operating um, uh, realities of that and the kinds of founders that we're interested in. I found just structurally making that more accommodating and I think more flexible made a huge difference. And so I do think that there it's it's narrative and it's structural. And if we really want to go fast, then yeah, we have to think about um, things like liquidity and portfolio balancing in very different ways uh, than we did when we just wanted to go and find 10 guys who could write $200,000 checks because they made a ton of money on a, uh, you know, exiting their company, you know, 10 years ago. These women are aggregating wealth in different ways at different paces. And there's just a huge opportunity to integrate them, but only if we integrate them in ways that I think are um, honestly aligned with where they're at and what they're looking for. That makes a lot of sense to me. And I really yeah. like the idea of letting them, you know, uh, come together and invest together. I think, I think that's something that will appeal to women, you know, 
they love, you know, they could do it together with friends in some way. And it's comforting, I think, to have other people to lean on when you're doing something for the first time. Yeah, we, yeah, it made it, yes. We did that with this last fund where we had a couple women that the, the minimum just was on their own, they partially they just they they needed more time. It, it's not that they didn't have the liquidity because uh, they were all they were all um, accredited. It's just that it felt like you want to get your pra- you want to practice, right? Uh, and and it they it was it was just sensible for all of us to allow them to group together, right? And I think that again, there's no one female behavior, and there are, I know women LPs who would hate that. They don't want yep. anyone else to know about what they're doing. Right. So again, I don't, I, it's not to like go back in time and start, you know, creating monoliths of female experience, but I can tell you that these are real persona. Um, and, and it was really fun to be a part of that and to realize like that I could do it. Like I could break the rules for them and make it happen because they're my rules and I get to write them now. So that was kind of awesome. Like I was pretty happy about that. So honestly, when I was younger, if that had been a, um, a possibility, I had a group of female CEOs that I used to meet with and, you know, we would just support one another. I think it's something we would have done. So kudos to you for coming up with it. You know, I'm not sure I came up with it as much as I just happened to be there when somebody just asked that they could do it. <laughs> and I was like, wait, I think you can, but we should, let's make it into something, right? So, all right, yeah. well, that's it. We we journey through the topic of women investing in women with our questions. Um, and I can't, uh, thank you again. Hey, is 412, uh, is that like a Pittsburgh area code? It is. It is. Okay, I have a feeling. All right, all right, because you know how I feel about I feel about Pittsburgh. Um, yeah. Well, thank you again. Thank you for all of your thoughtfulness, your mentorship, your guidance, and I'm so excited uh, to know that more and more women fund managers are going to be uh, modeling themselves after you in the years to come. I, and and I think we're really we're really really lucky to have you now um, running this venture fund. So I'm so excited to see what you you and your partners do with this fund. So thank you so much. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me. And you know that you're one of my role models here. So you were doing it before me and I, I feel like I've learned so much from you. So thank you.